As the racing world gradually gets back up on its feet, we find ourselves with an abundance of different racing series to watch, ranging from open wheelers to touring cars. But if I were to tell you about a racing series in Japan called Super GT, would you be aware of it? If not, you're in luck. And even if you are, stick around, because in this new series with the race, we'll break down why you should be watching Super GT. So Super GT is Japan's premier grand touring racing series, with an impressive array of cars and a world class set of racing drivers to match. But before we delve into the sport as it is now, a brief history lesson on the category and how it morphed into what it has become today. In 1993, the Japan Automobile Federation established a Japanese grand touring championship, which abandoned the Group C and Group A cars used in the previous iteration and adopted the super touring formula. Strict limits on power as well as weight penalties on race winners were imposed in a bid to ensure that no one team or manufacturer would dominate the series. At the conclusion of the 1995 season, a new set of regulations was put in place to help keep the cost from spiralling out of control. There were some incredible cars entered in this series, including the Honda NSX, Nissan Skyline GTR, and even the McLaren F1. For the 2005 season, the JGTC initially planned to host an event in Shanghai. The only problem was that under the International Sporting Code of the FIA, it would lose its status as the Japanese Championship. That is, if it were to host the Championship in more than two countries. And seeing as how it already had a round in Malaysia, the additional race in China would classify the series as an international championship. The series would subsequently be renamed Super GT, and has since carried that name despite the fact that the round in China never came to fruition. So that's a very brief history overview of the championship up to the present day. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes of the series. The field is split up into two classes, GT500 and GT300. Those names were initially meant to signify the maximum power limit of those categories, 500 horsepower for GT500 and 300 horsepower for GT300. However, as the years drew on, cars, as you would imagine, became more powerful, with the GT500 cars now producing around 650 brake horsepower, whereas the modern day GT300 cars have horsepower ranging from 400 to around about 550. The process of changing numbers was apparently one task too many, and so the GT500 and GT300 names live on to the present day. So what cars are in these classes? Well, let's actually start off with the GT300 class. Upon first glance, it may appear to be a field brimming with GT3 cars that you're probably familiar with, but this particular class has a few unique features about it. The GT300 regulations are split up into three different categories. The first is FIA GT3. These are the cars most of you are familiar with, and are identical to the ones found in other racing series across the world. If you feel perhaps this is too mainstream, you can build your own car to conform to the JAF GT300 regulations. Therefore, you will note the presence of two Toyota Prius Yes, those things exist. However, while they may have the body of a Prius, under the bonnet beats the heart of a very different animal. Because the regulations allow you to implement any engine from the manufacturer's range inside the car, these Priuses have V8 engines while maintaining hybrid systems from a Toyota Camry. And then finally, there are the mother chassis cars. The mother chassis class was conceived to combat the decrease in locally produced entries from specialist manufacturers. The cars utilize a standard dome-produced monocoque and a 4.5 litre V8 engine. Engine. Cars such as the Toyota 86 and Lotus Evora race in the series under those regulations. Until recently, there was a Toyota Mark X, which thankfully was killed off. Bruh. The GT500 class, however, is a whole different kettle of fish. As of 2020, there are three cars built to GT500 regulations the Nissan GTR, the Honda NSX, and the Toyota Supra. The engines used are turbocharged 2.0-litre four-cylinders that produce, as we discussed earlier, around about 650 brake horsepower. Though these are not spec engines, as Nissan, Honda, and Toyota develop their own engines for their respective cars. And when you listen to them on track, you can pretty much tell them apart through your engine note. These cars share similar properties to the cars in another series you may be familiar with, the German DTM Championship. And that's because in 2014, both Super GT and DTM announced the creation of Class 1, which unifies the technical regulations for both series, albeit with some minor differences. Something else that makes this category different is the presence of a tyre war. Rather than having a spec tyre, there are four different tyre makers throughout the grid, Bridgestone, Yokohama, Michelin and Dunlop. By the way, if you're still having trouble differentiating these two classes, an easy way to identify them is through the number panels on the side of the car. GT500 cars have white number panels, while for the GT300 cars, it's yellow. Ditto for the headlights. Got it? 
Fantastic. To help keep the field close, Super GT has a success ballast system, also known as the weight handicap. Weight penalties are assigned based on how well the car performs in the preceding race, with 2 kilograms added for every point scored. This is capped at 100 kilograms for safety reasons, although fuel flow restrictions will be implemented should this be exceeded. To prevent potential sandbagging, the ballast is halved in the penultimate event before finally being eradicated in the final round, although this is only applicable to teams who have competed throughout the entire season. Now that we've briefly skimmed over the cars, let's have a look at the circuits they race on. In the 2020 season, the series will only be visiting three circuits, Fuji Speedway, Suzuka International Racing Course, and Twin Ring Motegi. This is obviously due to the effects of COVID. As well as the aforementioned circuits of Fuji, Suzuka, and Motegi, the circuit also typically visits Autopolis, Okoyama International Circuit, Sportsland Sugo, Sepang International Circuit in Malaysia, and Chang International Circuit in Thailand. The races held on these circuits range from 250 kilometers to 500 kilometers, with the exception of a 500 mile race held at Fuji. Qualifying utilizes a knockout format, with the 15 minute Q1 session determining the positions from 14th and below for GT300 and 9th and below for GT500. After this, a 12 minute Q2 session is used to determine the remainder of the grid. Each car has two drivers assigned to it, meaning that at some stage during the race, drivers would be required to do the awakeno switch. However, a single driver cannot complete more than two thirds of a race. The act of doing so will lead to disqualification, an activity that yields no points. Speaking of which, points are allocated for the top 10 finishes, with 20 going to the winner, 15 for second place, 11 for third, 8 for fourth, and 6 for fifth. From there on in, it's one less point for the remaining positions. You keeping on track here? Good stuff, because every point is crucial. Last year's championship saw Ryo Hitakawa and Nick Cassidy lose out on the title by just two points to the eventual champions, Kazuya Oshima and Kenta Yamashita. Oh yeah, the drivers. Let's talk about those, shall we? You will find an abundance of different characters throughout the grid, from former Grand Prix drivers to gentlemen drivers. In the GT300 class, you will find more of the latter, although you will notice a few names up and down the grid with a wealth of success behind them, including the likes of JP Oliveira and former Le Mans winner Seiji Yada. It's in the GT500 category, however, where you will find more of the heavy hitters, so to speak. Drivers that you may have seen compete in Europe, such as Heike Kovalainen, Nick Cassidy, Nadei Fukuzumi, Sasha Finistraz, Jan Mardenbro, are just some of the drivers drivers that make up the 2020 grid. Notable alumni include former Grand Prix drivers such as Jensen Button, Kazuki Nakajima, Kamai Kobayashi, and Narayan Kartikeyan. So if you're keen to give the series a watch, all the races are broadcast live here on The Race, with English commentary provided by Sam Collins, Rob Barth, and Leo Gorman. Best of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free stuff? Be sure to give this video a thumbs up, and let us know if you'd like to see more videos like this. Subscribe to The Race for future content, so you can enjoy more of Japan's premier racing series. I've only got one.